All right, welcome to Quick Show. My name is Greg Matson, and I am your host, uh, Roe v. Wade. I, I will be very honest on this. I Number one, I don't, I rarely ever jump into this debate. Um, I, I just haven't. I have my own personal opinions on these things, um, and I do separate that somewhat from the legal side of things. Um, but I am, I, I'm surprised. I really am surprised that last Friday the uh, the Supreme Court made this change. I just thought that, uh, I mean, I'm happy about it. I think it's the right thing. But I just thought that it was so entrenched for the last, what, 50 years, almost 50 years now, that this just was never going to turn. I have always thought that Roe v. Wade was unconstitutional. and And looking at it, because the Supreme Court is looking at this as a as a legal issue, right? There, there's also the moral issue, of course. We're going to get into that, but it, it's the legal issue. And legally, I think that I, it just doesn't make any sense to me that this would be able to be uh, inferred somewhere in the Constitution. I think it was always a stretch. Now. Having said that, my feeling was that it should be legally moved to the states. I, I think that just trying to be practical with all of this, I always thought that's probably going to be the best place. Well, now we'll, we'll see what happens because there's so many lawsuits and, and new strategies now that are coming in to uh, take on the states, their own constitutions, um, other legal precedents that are in place, um, existing state law that is now open and running already um, with Roe v. Wade missing. So I want to go over a few of those things. And then I want to talk about the church and about, you know, it just seems to me that there is a, uh, that that in the last, you know, 15, 20 years, you, you, you've seen a rise, I think, in, in more uh, left-leaning members of the church. And, and left-leaning members of the church tend to side more on the pro-choice side. Not, not always, right? But they tend to side more on the, on the pro-choice side, which is part of the platform on the left. Um, but even then, even, I, I guess it's social media has been a big part of this because that, that is a minority voice, I think, in the church, and it's just gotten a lot louder. I've gone online uh, at times where I have seen um, very influential people in the church uh, as far as social media accounts that have been supportive of pro-choice and do not like, you know, don't like it when they hear things from the prophets and the brethren or other leaders of the church that talk about how evil abortion is. Uh, and then you'll see these threads that come down below this, like on Facebook and, and all of these other people saying why they think it's the right thing, why they think that uh, abortion is the right thing. And I just, I try to, I really do try to look at this in, with an open mind. I, I know people that have pro-choice, uh, um, that, that's what they believe in, right? They believe in pro-choice. And, and so I try to keep an open mind on this. I, I, again, legal. I think legally, I think it is to the states. I'm glad that's where it's at. I think that's where it should always have been. Uh, but I, it's hard for me to see how you square a pro-choice, complete elective abortion, right, outright elective abortion, with the teachings of the church and, and what has always been said about abortion. That's what I don't understand. I want to go over a couple of those points. And and uh, and talk about that a little bit. There's one thread on Twitter that I wanted to talk about that brings some of these things up. And looking at the angles of this argument about being a faithful member of the church and and being pro-choice. Now, I do not go to the point of saying I believe that you can't be a faithful member of the choice and be pro-choice. I think it's a big error, right? I, I think it's a problem. As far as reconciling these two, I don't see the reconciliation. I've never been able to 
have somebody show me that. Um, but there's there's those that that seem to somehow reconcile the position of the church with with scripture that is supported by scripture and then reconciling that with a a pro-choice view. Now what I wanted to do is I want to go through uh, a couple of the uh, the statements that the church has put out. And you know they put out a new a new statement based on the the overturn of Roe v. Wade. I just can't, I still can't believe I'm saying that. It's it's amazing. Uh, but they had put out a new um, statement on this, and so I wanted to go back and check a few old statements that the church has put out previously, right? And and see what they've said along the way here with uh, um, with abortion. So we're going to start off here by going to. Uh, 1973. So this is right after Roe v. Wade, right? Roe v. Wade comes in in 1973, and here's under the policies and procedures of the church. They have this on the website here. Policies and procedures statement on abortion, right? Here's what it says: In view of recent decision of the United, the a recent decision of the United States Supreme Court, we feel it necessary to restate the position of the church on abortion. All right, the same statement they've always had. In order that there be no misunderstanding of our attitude. In other words, even though this has become legal nationally, that is not what the church goes along with. It continues, the church opposes abortion and counsels its members not to submit to or perform an abortion except in the rare cases where, in the the opinion of competent medical counsel, the life or good health of the mother is seriously endangered or where the pregnancy was caused by rape and produces serious emotional trauma in the mother. I think later they're going to put in here uh, incest as well. So, and then even then it says it should be done only after counseling with the local presiding priesthood authority and after receiving divine confirmation through prayer. Now listen to this language right after Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade. This statement here continues and says, abortion must be considered one of the most revolting and sinful practices in this day. All right, so again, I, I'm going to lay these things out here, and then I'm going to go to this other thread, and I want to, tr- help me reconcile this. All right, guys, tell me, tell, me how, tell me how you reconcile this. Abortion must be considered one of the most revolting and sinful practices in this day when we are witnessing the frightening evidence of permissiveness leading to sexual immorality. And of course, these are tied together. Promiscuity and abortion are are highly tied together. That's the majority of the abortions that happen. And we also get this. Members of the church guilty of being parties to the sin, the sin of abortion, must be subjected to the disciplinary action of the council of the church as circumstances warrant. So that's the position back here, right? In dealing with this serious matter, it would be well to keep in mind the word of the Lord stated in the 59th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, verse 6, Thou shalt not steal, neither commit adultery, nor kill, nor do anything like unto it. Okay, so 1973, reaction to Wade. Now we move up to 1978 here. Here is an article that comes out uh, from a Susan H. Aylworth, right? And this is the, this is the title Five years later, right? This is the title of the of the uh, article. I've heard so much about the increase in abortions that I'm concerned. What can I do to help fight the problem? Right. So this is put out there as as to what you can do to fight the issue of now a legal abortion that's been legal for five years in the U.S. Here it is, right here. Join up. There are many organizations that serve the pro life movement. This is the church. I mean, what, what a drastic change we've made over 50 years here in talking about being active with certain things. It's interesting to me because this here is in the 70s. And, and when you go back to the 60s and the 70s, right, the pill comes around, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you've got this massive cultural change. It's the same thing that's happening today. And I start to wonder, are we going to hear more things like this? in the church where there is going to be a pushback on this rapid evolvement in culture uh, that is becoming more and more promiscuous, more and more uh, tolerant of sexual sin, 
uh, identitarianism. It, it, we'll have to wait and see. But here you have in 78, join up. There are many organizations that serve the pro-life movement. Can you imagine the response from some people if we were to put that up today? Right? A very different type of environment here in the church where there seems to be more of a, a diplomatic approach sometimes. Now, coming up here to the Institute, uh, what the Institute manual has here on the, on the topic of abortion. They quote President Gordon B. Hinckley in saying, abortion is an evil, stark, and real and repugnant, which is, let me, let me back that up again. Abortion is an evil, stark, and real and repugnant, which is sweeping over the earth. Right, so it's, it's pretty clear what they're saying. And I really, I'm trying to keep an open mind, even though I don't, I think it is a real moral issue. I, I, I just, I, I'm tr what I'm trying, it's not that I'm trying to learn if more of a pro-choice option is for me, right? That, that I, would, I would believe in that and support that. It's, I'm trying to bridge the gap to understand how members of the church are reconciling these types of words with with being pro-choice i really do want to know i don't see i i, I again i don't talk about this hardly at all but i just don't see the the gap being bridged here i i don't see solid arguments for this they go on and talk about teachings from president spencer w kimball quote abortion is a growing evil that we speak against right Again, abortion is a growing evil that we speak against. Certainly, the terrible sin of premeditated abortion would be hard to justify. It is almost inconceivable that an abortion would ever be committed to save face or embarrassment, to save trouble or inconvenience, or to escape responsibility. That's the real issue to me. How could one submit to such an operation or be party in any way by financing or encouraging? If special rare cases could be justified, certainly they would be rare indeed, which is true. We place it high on the list of sins against which we strongly warn the people. Okay, then we move to the church issues statement on abortion. All right, so this here is going to be 1991. Well, let's get back here. 1991. This is their statement on abortion in 1991. The church has issued a new statement on abortion. Dated Friday 11th, 1991, it reads, In view of the widespread, widespread public interest in the issue of abortion, we reaffirm that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has consistently opposed elective abortion. More than a century ago, the First Presidency of the Church warned against this evil. We have repeatedly, so you're talking about the whole history of the church here, getting not a whole history of the church, but... Going back now 130 years, more than 130 years, it's been consistent in talking about the sin of abortion. We have repeatedly counseled people everywhere to turn from the devastating practice of abortion for personal or social convenience. And then it goes into the rare cases that could happen here. Um, and then here we go again, quote, The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as an institution has not favored or opposed specific legislative proposals or public demonstrations concerning abortion. Okay, so here they're saying they're, they're not supporting anything. You did see the other article about joining here, but here, you know, hey, we're not supporting any legislative issues here for or against. So they are staying back here, at least in 1991. In as much, as much as this issue is likely to arise in all states in the United States of America and in many other nations of the world in which the church is established, it is impractical for the church to take a position on specific legislative proposals on the important subject. Okay, so they've got a moral, spiritual position, but they're not going to get involved on the legislative side. However, they say, we continue to encourage our members as citizens to let their voices be heard in appropriate legal ways that will evidence their belief in the sacredness of life. So the church isn't going to go officially and go in and do that, but they're encouraging the, the, the members to do it. Right. So it, this, I, I don't know, have, have, have those that are pro-choice in the church read these words before? I, I'm, I'm just wondering, really. I, 
big gap here. 2008, a talk by then Elder Russell M. Nelson. Here's the title, Abortion, an Assault on the Defenseless. Okay, so here's the man that becomes prophet today. He talks about the death rates of wars, how much is so much higher with, uh, with abortion. And then he goes into divine doctrine. He says, this matters greatly to us because the Lord has repeatedly declared this divine imperative. Thou shalt not kill, nor do anything like unto it. Even before the fullness of the gospel was restored, enlightened individuals understood the sanctity of human life. Man-made rules have now legalized that which has been forbidden by God from the dawn of time. Human reasoning has twisted and transformed absolute truth into soundbite slogans that promote a practice that is consummately wrong. Then it goes into the special concerns where there might be exceptions to the rules and stuff like this. Um, to deny life to an individual because of a possible handicap is a very serious matter. Uh, so they're, they're going against that. Abortion on demand. Relatively few abortions are performed for the special circumstances to which I have referred. Most abortions are performed on demand to deal with unwanted pregnancies. These abortions are simply a form of birth control. And then this is an important issue here that he brings up. He says, when the controversies about abortion are debated, individual right of choice is invoked as though it were the one supreme virtue. How do I feel about it? Right? Does that sound familiar today? That could only be true if but one person were involved. Okay. The rights of any one individual do not allow the rights of another individual to be abused. In or out of marriage, abortion is not solely an individual matter. Terminating the life of a developing baby involves two individuals with separate bodies, brains, and hearts. A woman's choice for her own body does not include the right to deprive her baby of life and a lifetime of choices that her child would make. As Latter-day Saints, we should stand up for choice, the right choice, not simply for choice as a method, right? Again, we should stand up for choice, the right choice, not simply for choice as a method. Now, moving on here, we go to the topic of abortion, an overview that uh, the church has on their topics uh, section. Human life is a sec sacred gift from God. Elective abortion for personal or social convenience is contrary to the will and the commandments of God. Church members who submit to, perform, encourage, pay for, or arrange for such abortions may lose their membership in the church. Um, look, regardless of what you think of the policies, you certainly you cannot think that the church is not completely against this against elective abortion. It continues, In today's society, abortion has become a common practice defended by deceptive arguments. Latter-day prophets have denounced abortion, referring to the Lord's declaration, Thou shalt not kill. Their counsel on the matter is clear. Members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints must not submit to, perform, encourage, pay for, or arrange for an abortion. Church members who encourage an abortion in any way may be subject to church discipline. All right, then go into the exceptions on this. So, uh, you know, that's, that's in the topics portion on this. And then this here is where we are today. This is the abortion um, page, which has been updated as of the turn of the Dobbs uh, decision overturning Roe v. Wade. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints believes in the sanctity of human life. Therefore, the church opposes elective abortion for personal or social convenience and counsels its members not to submit to, perform, encourage, pay for, or arrange for such abortions. The church allows for possible exceptions, goes into the pregnancy resulting from rape or incest. A competent or physician, deter uh, physician determines that the life or health of the mother is in serious jeopardy, or a competent physician determines that the fetus has severe defects that will not allow the baby to survive beyond birth, right? So those are the exceptions there. And then again, even these exceptions do not automatically justify abortion. Abortion is a most serious matter. It should be considered only after the persons responsible have received 
confirmation through prayer. Members may counsel with their bishops as part of this process. The church's position, this is as of last Friday, the church's position on this matter remains unchanged, and you've seen what it's been. As states work to enact laws related to abortion, and this is interesting here, church members may appropriately choose to participate in efforts to protect life and to preserve religious liberty. There is no question as to where the church stands on this. They are telling you right here, church members may appropriately choose to participate in efforts to protect life and to preserve religious liberty. Now, having read those statements there, it's not that I don't understand that some people see the idea of the, the choice of the woman as, as being so high in all this. I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. I think you need responsibility. You take on responsibility. But again, I just don't see where they, where do you pull this together to say, I am pro-choice. I'm fine with pro-choice. I'm fine with, you know, 95 plus percent of all abortions that are elective abortions for convenience or economic reasons. Um, being okay, and yet this is what the church stands for, right? And I, it's just that I don't get. I don't think there's an issue in membership there, and, and that's a problem with being a member believing in that. I just don't understand how how you support it. You know, actually support it. That would be by voting and maybe giving money in, in a way that is that it would be completely against what the church has always taught. And, and again, it's not just policy. It's they're, they're bringing this out in Scripture. They're, they're supporting it with Scripture, in their minds at least, right? They're supporting it with Scripture here. So anyway, I thought that was really interesting to go through and, uh, and see how the church over time has pretty much had the same position. And um, now I want to go and look at uh, well, what I'm going to do here is I'm not going to actually put this up here because I don't want to put his name in there. But there's a thread here. I'm going to read some of this that is on Twitter. And this is someone who says, I'm an active LDS and have served and sacrificed for my beliefs. I feel my faith deeply. Okay, I don't question that. I know what LDS leaders have said about abortion. Okay, again, I, I'm just wondering, do you? really know have you gone through these things here have you read these things and protecting life and religious freedom okay that sounds like he's only read maybe the the latest statement i am pro-choice and because it is a minority view with lds members i want to share why okay well, let's see what the arguments are here he says i believe in our divine ability to choose okay now what did we hear about the method of choosing previously God values, respects, and protects this right. Correct. He does. That's agency. We are responsible and bear consequences for our choices. I don't believe God is coercive. One can't limit the eternal options for someone else. Our salvation is our choice alone. So what about murder as a whole? Everything you said here would fit in there with murder. right? God respects and protects the right for people to choose to murder someone. We are responsible and bear consequences for our choices. I don't believe God is coercive. One can't limit the eternal options for someone else. So murder's okay because you're not limiting their eternal options, the person being murdered, right? Or who you're stealing from, whatever it might be. See, that th these arguments are so weak. Here's another one. The argument to compel a woman to carry a fetus to full term is belief that the fetus should be protected against the woman's will. We lack consensus on when and if to compel this protection. Should it be at the single cell of conception or at viability or at some other point? I get that. That's true. We don't know. When does the soul enter into the body? When is this a life? However, if you don't know, why are you messing with it? Right? If you don't know, then why are you messing with it? He goes on, some people in religious belief and religions believe that at conception life begins and ensoulment occurs. 
For them, fetal death is no different than the death of a live birth of a baby or child. Well, we don't treat it that way. I mean, the church doesn't treat it that way. It is a serious sin, but it's not murder. He goes on and says, Beliefs about when life begins and when and if installment occurs can't be subjected to scientific study and are varied by people and religions. Some Christian, Jewish, and other faiths are pro-choice because of their religious beliefs. What does that have to do with the, the Latter-day Saints? What does that have to do with the restored gospel and prophetic counsel? Very consistent prophetic counsel. I, th th this just I, I this to me just goes on and it's 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 more of a hope of change, right? Kind of like we have with other things like temple marriage and and other things within the church. It's more like I'm just hoping there's going to be a change, and therefore I'm going to be ahead of it, and and I'm going to support my own beliefs on this, even though they vary so far away from policy and procedure, and really doctrinally here. They're supporting it doctrinally. Um, that's, it's just hard for me to get this. I, I, I find it so incredibly weak, this, this type of an argument here. Uh, he goes on, LDS have no doctrine on when life begins and insolment occurs. Again, then why are you messing with it? Why would you mess with it? We don't record miscarriages or stillbirths on church records or do ordinances for them. Wow. Miscarried or aborted fetuses, fetus do, does, don't lose eternal opportunity. We don't believe ab abortion is murder. No, we don't believe it is murder. But we believe it's pretty bad. Right? There, there's a problem here. We're stopping, we're holding back and, ma and, and making decisions to hold back on a new life coming down to the earth. Right? Go back to Genesis. There, there are so many things I've found lately that as our world is changing so fast right now, that they go right back to the fundamental truths of Genesis, the beginning of, the, of, of creation and the Garden of Eden. Be fruitful and multiply the earth. So he's making the argument then again, again, where, when does it start? I, 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 that, that is not an argument for choice here. That doesn't have any anything to do with choice. And that doesn't have anything to do with, with uh, uh, the sin of abortion. Because if you don't know, you don't know. LDS have policies that defines the elective abortion as a sin for its members except for rape, incest, and the life and health of the mother and fetus. The church also encourages us to protect life and religious liberty, Okay. When governments compel and control people, it is committing violence, which should only occur when there are clear advantages to society that a consistent majority agree upon. Some violence is necessary, like requiring us to pay taxes or caging violent criminals. Wow. Wow. Pregnancy is a big deal with emotional and physical costs. Here's where we're going to lose. He's going to go against personal responsibility. When the government compels a woman against her will to carry a fetus to full term, it commits violence against her. So is the church committing violence against her by saying this is what the church believes and, and these are the consequences of it? That's what I would ask this guy. Is the church committing violence against the woman who's, who's having an abortion? I think a lot of members would say yes. There are consequences. Life is not perfect. You need to take responsibility. We, we can't remove that. We just, you can't remove personal responsibility. And we're doing that at a breakneck, breakneck speed right now in everything. Why do I call it violence? Because it is, he says. The word is stark and escalated, but reflect show, escalated, but reflect show it feels to someone that doesn't make much sense. When one with power takes away choice and imposes a cost on another. What about the other being the fetus? <laughs> uh, he goes on with violence here. I'm not going to keep going there. Um, the primary driver to ban abortion comes from religious beliefs. I see no broad societal benefits for banning abortion. <laughs> what? Are, you just said you're a faithful Latter-day Saint. 
I see pregnancy as a private issue for the woman based on her religious beliefs. My belief compels me to guarantee a woman's right to choose for herself. So his belief, personally, his religious belief, fine, he has his own personal belief, but he's arguing completely against the church and its position on this. Very strong, strong position on this. That's where there's no reconciliation. And again, he can have his own beliefs, but his, his arguments are so weak. Very weak, being a, an active Latter-day Saint, understanding the plan of salvation. These are very weak arguments. Uh, banning abortion is a religious view, not shared by all. Coming from a minority religion, I am extra sensitive to religious freedom and believe that we need to protect people's ability to live according to their beliefs. Religious freedom should guarantee abortion rights. <laughs> okay, all right. Even though he just said the exact opposite, that banning abortion comes mostly from religious beliefs, right? That is, is you know, and I'm not going any further on this. this the, the, but this, these are the, the reason I bring this up is because there's so many examples here. Uh, oh, let me do one more here because here we're going to get men. Men make laws banning abortion but bear almost no cost. This is ridiculous. Who votes for the men? More women vote than men do. This is the worst argument. You hear so many times that women aren't represented. Women vote more than men. Yet, he says, men are the major contributor to pregnancy as pointed out by fellow LDS member at Design Mom in this viral thread. Men are the major contributor to pregnancy. Hmm. Okay. I, I, I always thought that there were two people involved with this. Um, some say unwanted pregnancy is a consequence of bad behavior by the woman and she should bear the responsibility. But even if that were the case, it is a relig it is religiously created view and shouldn't negate the right for the woman to choose. And there is always a man involved. There is always a man involved. Yeah, and yet, if you're, there's always a man involved, does the man get a say then? You're, you're, bearing the, you're giving him responsibility for her being pregnant. Then if he has responsibility on that end, does he also have responsibility in a say of that fetus being aborted, that baby being aborted? It, it, weak. It's always weak. That's, that's about as far as I'm going to go with this. That, that, that does it right there. And, and so, you know, again, I try to keep an open mind trying to figure out how a, a decent number of members of the church get to that point of view. And, uh, you know, they have their opinion. Fine. You know, I, I, I get it. You have your opinion. But I, I, what I'd want to try and figure out is how do you reconcile this? These are horrible arguments. How do you reconcile your position with the church's position of 150 years or more on this? And, and taking such a consistently strong position, even encouraging its members to go out and try to protect life. As this goes to the state levels... And there's going to be lawsuits that are going in uh, with current legislation that is already in place. Some of that is being enacted right now uh, and is, is ready to go immediately. Uh, some of it is being pushed back by, by judges. We're going to see a lot of that, right? A lot of judges are going to hold off on legislation in the states until they get it further approved going through the appeals process, whatever they have to do. You'll see a lot of, a lot of uh, I think you're going to see a lot of things go now to the state constitutions. That would be the next place to go. And so if, if it's, it's legal, if this is only a state's issue, then now they go to the state constitution and they try to read into that, just like Roe v. Wade did, and uh, go from there. We're seeing this already happen in Utah. We're seeing this happen in Georgia, South Carolina. Where, where a lot of these are, are being held up by courts or pushed forward immediately. They're already, they're already off and running and hitting the ground uh, with their own state 
laws on abortion. And then here's the last issue I wanted to talk about. We are already becoming more and more polarized in the states. There are, you know, we, we focus so much on the purple states, right? Because you don't know which way those are going to go in an election, in a national election. But the truth is, is that most states are becoming more red and becoming more blue. And is this just another item, another issue, which has always been a lightning rod issue that is going to change demographics? Right? If you live in a, a fairly lean red state and you are for pro-choice and this is you're done with this and you're going to move to a state that is pro-choice and vice versa, are we going to see more and more of this? There's all these issues that keep coming up. Education's another one where you see people moving. And uh, it's not in small amounts. I mean, look what's happening in Tennessee. I mean, it's becoming redder and redder and redder. So I, I, I see that there's there's going to be a pull demographically with this issue a little bit. You know, not going to move the needle a lot, but it, it might move it a little bit and could make some changes uh, in future elections in the in the states. So anyway, in, you know, in the responses, if you're on YouTube especially, and you believe in pro-choice in this matter for elective abortions, just, you know, tell me why. Try Give me a good argument morally and and how you reconcile that with what the church says i would want to know that i want to see that i would want to be open to your ideas i don't agree with them but uh i I want to see your your form of thinking your logic behind going with that knowing what the doctrine is behind it knowing about the plan of salvation and knowing what the prophets have said consistently and strongly for so long thanks for your time Mm -hmm.